Joseph Joe Paloweski, co-founder and architect of in-space metal processing at Cislunar Industries. Cislunar is about enabling debris removal and recycling, metal propellant production, and in-space manufacturing. Today we sit down with the architect for all of their systems. Here's a couple of images of what they're working on. In this interview, I was left with this image in my head for the world Joe is trying to build, and it's one that closely resembles Star Trek. Limitless resources, advanced technology, and kids of all walks of life being able to achieve their best. We explore and deep dive into a lot in this episode. If you like this type of content, please subscribe and like because every bit helps. Chapters and timestamps below. Let's stay curious and learn about Joe and the future of space manufacturing in this episode of Learn With Lowell Show. All right, sweet. So then what does an architect of in-space metal processing do? Like that was, uh, it's a cool title. It's kind of like a Overmind or whatever the heck Elon Musk calls himself nowadays. But what do you actually do? Sure. Well, uh, I design systems to, to process metal in space. So the end goal is to be able to deliver metal where it's needed and when it's needed anywhere in the cislunar space. So between here and the moon. Uh, now, we don't limit ourselves to that. We think the moon is a good beachhead or a stepping stone to get to further out in space, to get to Mars and beyond. Uh, but the moon makes a really good uh, stepping stone so that you can build things and launch them further out. And, and also back to Leo, there's one sixth of the gravity on, or about takes one sixth of the uh, energy to get something off the moon as it does from the surface of the earth. So it's actually less propellant expense to launch something from the moon to low earth uh, orbits and things like that. than it would be to launch something from, you know, Cape Canaveral or something. Yeah. I think I was hearing that it, once you're like out of the gravity, well, to some extent, like you're already like halfway there in terms of most places in the universe. But the hardest yeah. part is just getting up there. The hardest part is getting out of the dang gravity well of the Earth. So, um, so yeah, so there's a huge advantage to building things, uh, deriving your materials and building rockets and launching uh, cargo from the moon. You can do it at a significant uh, reduction in propellant and materials than you would from Earth. So, yeah. um, so, so that's, that's why, uh, you know, originally, uh, when I got into this, I'd spent, uh, 15 years in manufacturing, uh, space, airspace, building, building things in space has always been a dream of mine since I was, since I can remember. Uh, and I went to school for aerospace, graduated in 2007. Uh, for those of you who were starting your careers, then was not a great time to start a career. Uh, definitely was not, uh, a very motivating time to try to do anything really far out there uh, because a lot of people, of course, were, were just trying to hold on to their jobs because of the recession. Um, but I was able to segue, uh, I went to school for aerospace and I was able to segue that knowledge into uh, high-speed manufacturing, uh, doing high-speed air conveyors and things like this. Uh, so I built uh, hundreds of plants around the country and throughout the world. Uh, if you're drinking something out of a can like this, or a plastic bottle, uh, chances are better than not, it ran on some kind of equipment that I built. Um, and be, based on that success, I realized that for, uh, you know, I started hearing about in-space manufacturing, I was following what SpaceX was doing. And then of course there's many other really fascinating startups that are doing stuff like SpaceX uh, that, that, are, that are doing really great stuff. So in-space manufacturing uh, in, in my mind, based on what's happening right now is, is being enabled. It's gonna happen in our lifetimes. Um, and same thing as I saw in manufacturing, you know, we're going to need, we're going to need the steel. We're going to need, we're going to need the parts. We're going to need like this, the hardware, all the, all the components that goes into manufacturing here on the earth. We're going to need that in space. Um, so uh, I looked back at like the railroads. That was kind of one of the big motivators or like these skyscrapers that you see. And uh, I said, man, you know, this took a lot of metal. You, you see the, you know, you see the finish, the people on the skyscraper, you see the, you know, people driving the last spike into the international and intercontinental railroad and the railroad, you know, the locomotives, but you don't think about necessarily the foundries and the operations that went on to get that material in the first place that allowed us to do that industrialization. Uh, so, so anyway, architect of in-space metal processing, that comes from in order to, to have this industrialization of space, we're going to need metal. We're going to need, you know, and we're going to need, we're going to need the metal to make the shovels, to dig the ore, to get the metal, the, you know, future materials. Uh, it really, that to me, that is the enabler uh, for in-space manufacturing. Um, and then beyond that, the big motivator for me is an abundance of resources. Um, so I think that to me, the root of all evil is uh, the idea that resources are limited. Um, and, you know, you can go a lot of different directions with that, but at the end of the day, 
uh, abundant resources that don't impact our lives that, you know, we don't have to sacrifice for are, are the best way to survive. Uh, and so that's why I look off world. You know, I think that uh, with, with climate change, with, with, you know, uh, with, with a variety of problems that we're facing today, I, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of ways we can talk about how to solve those, but probably the best thing we can do is to use less resources on this earth to use the resources, you know, life support, uh, every other planet or place that we know of is desolate and we can't live there. So we can use resources from those places to support life here on this planet and uh, have an abundance of resources to sustain our life uh, for many millenniums to come. So that's, that's what gets me up every day and keeps me motivated, I guess, it's, it's a big picture. Um, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So, but again, we're going to need shovels, we're going to need metal to make it happen. <laughs> we're going to need it in space. So that's, uh, what, that's how I came to be architect of in-space metal processing. What is the... Um... I imagine there's a, there, there's different things you need to worry about when you're on the planet versus in space. And at the same time, I've, I was reading about something called cold welding. I don't know if that's a, a part of anything you guys do, but um, yeah. <laughs> what what are the different things you have to worry about? So if it, if you have a, a foundry uh, creating metal, and I'm from the Chicago region, so I mean, I saw tons of those giant things. Or if anyone's ever seen Rudy, there, there's some of that in there. Uh, so you have these wide spaces, this you know heated metal moving around, moving into different uh, grooves to make up presses and stuff. What does it look like in space? What's like, yes. uh, well, so, so in space, uh, foundries, which is really what we're doing. So there's a difference between a forge and a foundry. Mm. Um, a foundry is really taking metal, melting it down, alloying it, uh, and then casting it into an ingot. Um, a lot of times these plants like in Chicago area and, and, and you know, where automotive in Michigan, Detroit, where all the cars are made, uh, it's a continuous casting process. So they'll actually cast into kind of like a big slab and then they'll just, there's a rolling mill attached to the casting plant. And then that just goes right into a rolling mill and it comes out as sheet metal, which is then stamped into the bodies for cars and other parts or formed into beams, whatever. So, you know, that's, that's kind of the foundation of how metal is made. Uh, now, when we do this in space, um, there's a couple different things that we have to adapt to for the environment of space. So there's no gravity um, and, and cooling is a problem. So there's, there's, it's a vacuum. So uh, as far as insulating something, uh, so, so it's actually easier to keep the heat in than to get rid of the heat. Um, right. So anyway, the way we can accomplish that is uh, we use electromagnetics uh, to replace the forces of gravity. Uh, because in a continuing, typically for like casting or any kind of metal making process, um, gravity is what's used. Metal's hot. You know, we work with aluminum because it's one of the lower temperature melting alum, uh, metals. We will work with a lot of other things, um, but even aluminum melts at uh, around 700 C, around 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so this will melt most things. That's why gravity is used in uh, in these casting plants because uh, any kind of mechanisms like you know pumps, stuff like that that has seals doesn't work very well when you have very high temperatures. Oh, and then of course, if it does get cool and it freezes, now you've got literally just metal that's frozen and very abrasive as you can imagine on a pump or something like that. Uh, so, so yeah, a big hurdle is gravity and the lack thereof. Uh, so electromagnetics is one of the ways we uh, cross that hur hurdle and then cooling. So um, with electromagnetics, uh, what we can do is we can avoid touching something. Um, so we can try to contactlessly manipulate something um, and, and touch it just a very little bit. On a, on a terrestrial foundry system, you're using refractories, you're using a lot of ceramics. Um, and although the ceramics can hold up to phenomenally high temperatures, um, they usually don't last forever. So uh, if you've been into uh, like a glass plant, for example, uh, I was at an Owens current corning plant and they were telling me that every... Uh, I think every four or five years or something like that, they have to replace the lining in their furnace. Uh, but but every every few days, they, they'll get little tiny leaks. And the way they fix the little tiny leaks is there's a guy with, it uh, looks like a, a weed sprayer, but it's full of water. And he goes up and he sprays it with water and it freezes. And that's that's how they stop leaks. We can't do that in space. Um, so, so really, uh, a foundry... You know, there's some really high tech stuff going on in, in modern foundries, but there's also some really low tech, like, you know, guys with squirt guns, freezing, there's leaks, and then, <laughs> you know, literally just relining, you know, just things are made to wear out and they're made to be replaced. 
we can't do that in space. So that's, that's one of the, one of the, the tricky things. Now you mentioned cold welding too, which is really cool. I can tell you, you've done a little bit of research here. Um, cold welding is something that I guess arguably happened on the Apollo program. Uh, I think that was, uh, one of the, I, I can't remember whether they, they determined, I, I, I think that they determined it wasn't actually cold welding, but, uh, they, they thought that that was why they couldn't get the hatch open. Um, so in a vacuum, uh, you don't have to be in space. Uh, you have to be in a really good vacuum, uh, which you have in space. Uh, if you have two materials, like a, uh, if you cut an aluminum rod and you, and then you sand it or you, you, you buff it. So it's a real nice smooth finish, like a mirror finish. And you have two mirror finishes in a vacuum. Uh, the, the, the atoms don't know that there's no difference. They don't, they don't know that it's not a different material. Uh, so literally the, the, they think it's part of the same, you know, material and, and they just start sharing, they start sharing, you know, parts of the material and they become part of the same material. Um, and, and so that's called cold welding and it's a, it's a pretty interesting thing. Uh, now, you know, when that door happened on Apollo, a lot of engineers were concerned about it. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of considerations that, you know, something that, that we're all taught about uh, when we're getting into this kind of field. Uh, but in practice, it's actually pretty hard to get a cold weld uh, when you want it to happen. So, you know, normally you avoid that for the, uh, you know, you'd have to have pretty perfect conditions to occur for a cold weld to, to really, you know, be a problem on orbit. Uh, but it's definitely something we think about. So we try to work with, you know, not have two identical material. You know, you wouldn't make a bearing out of two identical materials. Um, but it wouldn't be a good plan. Uh, and we definitely would consider that. Uh, it is definitely something that we're, you know, uh, we're thinking about as, as joining methods uh, in the future could be something. Take advantage of the environment of space, you know, and save a lot of energy. If you don't have to heat up the material, you can just weld it based on, on cold welding. Uh, there could be some really cool opportunities in the future. Yeah, I was, I was thinking that uh, you can move it around with your, the magnetism. And then as long as there's a way to like make it clean, I guess, I don't know how you would shine it in that way then you could just like fuse it up kind of like a 3d printer or something like slowly spewing it up and then like they like kind of conjoin or whatever um but- yeah well, one of the advantages to forming and doing this work in space is that uh our environment is inert so it doesn't exist um we actually right now we use we create our own environment in our environment because otherwise we evaporate our material hmm. Is a is it cold welding only happen with metals, or if you had like an organic material and you touch them together, would it do the same thing? Or is it just like a metal phenomenon? Uh, I I believe that this is a metal phenomenon. At least this is to the extent I've studied it. I will say, mm. I and I will always say there, somebody's probably smarter than me at some of these fields. It's I, you can only get so deep, and then you got to hire a PhD. <laughs> so, but I believe that this is typically a phenomenon with conductive materials, so metals. Okay. And then uh, I was curious more about how the electromagnetism works, especially as a minute ago, I was like showing up, I was looking at some diagrams, but like how, what are the size of these units as they're going to go up in space and are they scalable? And then um, I'm just used to magnets being something you you keep away from electronics. So then how are you controlling it? And so, yeah, type of thing. You know, I had, I, I've uh, gotten to meet some, some folks that do fusion work. So the, the kind of electronics that we're dealing with are, are very high field strength. Um, you know, the ones that we flew were 150 Gauss. Um, and, you know, so that's like 15 millitesla. Um, and a Tesla is kind of what an MRI, you know, machines are rated at is one or two Teslas for that giant magnet and an MRI, which will suck an oxygen tank in from the hallway. So, you know, you get, one Tesla is a whole lot and, you know, we're working at millitesla's. Um, so it's still quite a bit. Um, the type of EMI that you're allowed to have is, is like fractions of a Gauss. It's like milligauss. Um, uh, so, so the way the, the, the trick to this though, I, I was talking to some folks in fusion. They're like, how did, you know, that's crazy. Like, how do you not like wreck the plane or whatever? Um, and, and it has a lot to do with uh, magnets. Magnetic fields can be guided not unlike electrons and an electric circuit. Um, so using ferrite materials, uh, magnetic materials, uh, we can create magnetic circuits and we can contain our flux, our magnetic flux lines so that they don't extend out of our workpiece. So that's, that's how we're able to do that is that we're, we're literally focusing our fields and, and guiding them much like you would electricity, um, mm. to, to keep it focused where we want it as otherwise, um, 
we would, you know, we, we'd be creating, we use a lot of induction type fields. So we're not just using, you know, there, there are times where we might use a DC or a, a, a just a, a fixed magnetic field. Uh, but most of the time we're using an alternating magnetic field uh, because we're working with non-magnetic metals. Um, and an alternating magnetic field is also basically a RF source at some level. So it could be a really powerful radio transmitter. Um, and unless we, you know, do something to keep that magnetic field contained, um, you know, we might cause all the instruments on the airplane we're flying in to go crazy or, you know, block out people's cell phones or whatever. It's a, <laughs> we're working on, uh, on, on kilohertz frequencies at this point. There's, there's often other frequencies that happen. Uh, but, but yeah, without getting too farther down a, a, a rabbit hole in electromagnetics and field guiding, um, they're, they're very powerful magnets and, and it's done with, uh, with, with field guiding and ferrite materials. That's interesting. And then, um, I didn't know. So it, it used to just like a magnet being somewhat uniform, like the poles of a planet and there's like a magnet, a magnetic field that comes out and it's kind of like all of them are more or less the same. I think yep. like Saturn's is very similar to Earth's, but it's just bigger. Yeah. You can, you can, you can like move that around with technology like yours, like the magnetism, so, or is it? So there's there's a couple things going on here. So the uh, the Earth and most most planets have magnetic fields. Um, well, at least I mean the Earth definitely does because we have an iron core and we have magnetic material going on inside. Um, so you know that's going to be like a, a DC or a, a fixed magnetic field uh, that you know you can have a compass and it's going to take you to that. Um, the kind of we're, we're making artificial magnetic fields like that we're generating using, you know, electromagnetics. So there's a DC electromagnet, you're turning it on and it's a DC and it's just, it's like, it's got a North pole and a South pole, um, kind of like the magnetic field on the earth. Um, and the, the field that we're using though is actually a, an AC magnetic field. So it's constantly flipping AC, DC, AC, you know, from plus minus, you know, the, the plus is totally, is changing all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and we need to do that because that's how we can melt things like aluminum or something that's not magnetic, like iron. Um, so, so one of the other areas that electromagnets are used predominantly in space is for something called a magnetorker. Um, and the way a magnetorker works is it's the, typically a cube sat will have a magnetorker and a, a like a gyro or a, a reaction wheel. And uh, the reaction wheel is just a gyro. It's like spinning. And you can imagine if you, if you're floating in space and you're spinning something and you, you break that thing that's spinning, well, then your object's going to start spinning. Um, and then, then you literally, then you have these other things called magnetorkers. And there's usually two of them at different, you know, 90 degrees to each other. Um, so the magnetorkers can counter the input from from the uh, from the magnet from the torker, uh, and then they also uh, they they're actually reacting to the Earth's magnetic field, which is pretty cool. So they're you know you've got north south pole on your Earth, and you can you can just turn on a bar magnet, and and then you can end up actually getting um, some some ability to guide your satellite with that magnet. Um, now, once you get far enough away from the Earth's magnetic field, uh, so pretty much, you know, once you get much beyond low Earth orbit, um, that that technique doesn't work anymore because there's not enough of a field to to react to. So that yeah, the reaction that that stuff doesn't work, um, and then you have to rely on propulsion. Uh, but anyway, but those are two kind of two different, two slightly different things. So there's uh, you know, there's 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 electromagnetics for keeping satellites and stuff on orbit. And, you know, we're, you know, eventually keep the stations that we build stuff on orbit or, you know, it could help with some of that guidance um, or at least with some of the direction kind of steering. Um, but, but beyond that, we're, we're looking more at um, electromagnetic fields that are, are very focused uh, for, for manipulating things within our foundry systems. And they, they really, they don't, they're not used for guidance on our system at all. It's uh, so typically it just to make it clear too, like what, what Cislunar does, we're, we're not building spacecraft. Uh, these are all, these foundries are all going to be hosted on uh, spacecraft or platforms and more than likely they'll be hosted on free flying platforms that will replace the space station and, and provide infrastructure to build on going out to the moon. Are you, um, are you going to uh, get a piggyback ride on the new, like, 
I, I forget what it's called, but it's the one where they're sending a starship around the moon. It'd be kind of nice. They could like work on a little foundry. Like on uh, what are they can do for like five days? They got to do something. Uh, you know, cool experiment. that one's coming up pretty soon. Um, I, we, you know, we're always, we're always looking for opportunities to put payloads on rockets. Uh, and we, we have a few opportunities coming up. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, I don't have anything. I haven't, I haven't heard of an opportunity to go on, on that particular flight. Uh, but you know, these things come up all the time. There's it's, it's interesting how, uh, you know, the way, one way to uh, now nowadays these rockets have so many different payloads going on them that um you know it, it's really in spacex and rocket lab and everyone else who's launching rockets right now is in their best interest to sell as many small tickets as they can uh to, to fly those so so it gives companies like ours a great opportunity to flight qualify things uh and that is really the, the key is just have a, they call it the uh, technology readiness level but you want to advance your trl level um and you have a plan for doing that so uh, we have a plan to fly our foundry on the ISS, on you know International Space Station, uh, and to to make rods and sustain microgravity. Um, and then uh, we have plans to have a free flyer, so you know something that's not the ISS. Uh, the you know the International Space Station is great, uh, but it's it's human habitat. Uh, so if you want to do something that's potentially you know. If it totally goes wrong, it could crash the station. Well, you can't do that on ISS, period. Even if there's like a one in 10,000 chance of it doing that, if there's any chance, that's so, you know. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's just a, a differentiator there is uh, we're flying on other people's uh, hard, you know, other people's platforms. Is it, is it, what, what can be done in space using technology that you're developing that we can't do? on earth like what are the unique advantages that it has yeah well so the reason to build on orbit is because we're limited um by launch so launch is a pretty violent event um most of the time your you know spacex flight or any anything that you're going to fly on right now is going to have a 5g uh kind of a rating so so five times the force of gravity is what your payload has to be designed for um and, and, you know, so you can imagine if you, you know, if you're, if you're, you can think of something very simple, like a table, if you're trying to fly a table to, to the moon, uh, well, that table has to be able to support five times its weight or whatever it was meant to hold. It's got to f hold five times more than that. Um, so, you know, you can imagine a table that was meant to hold maybe twice its weight um, for a typical application. Uh, if it has to be designed five times that it's, it's going to be, kind of bulky it's going to have big thick legs and it's going to be you know made out of heavier materials um and this is kind of the, this is the compounding problem with space is that we have to be able to survive launch which means designing something structurally so that it can design launch uh, but that means adding weight and mass and the more mass we add the more the less we can launch and the bigger rocket we need so this is kind of a uh this is why the apollo rockets were the size of skyscrapers and you know the the payload that they took to the moon was like the size of a small car um you know you you end up with a whole lot of propellant in order to get a very little amount of mass into space so what we can do if we manufacture in space is uh we can design structures you know once you're in the space environment with microgravity um there isn't there really isn't a lot of force that you need structure for um you know the most force the space station ever has to contend with is when uh, when they turn on their propulsion system to to keep their station on at the right elevation, there's some drag from you know solar winds and things like this and 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 whatever particles in the upper atmosphere uh, that that cause it to need to burn uh, propellant every once in a while to keep it to just to to regain that elevation that it loses over time or else it would crash in the ocean. Uh, so 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 yeah, that's uh, that's that's a big a big part of the logistics here is is how do you <laughs> How do you do that? How do you keep your station in orbit? How do you uh, how do you maintain all these all these things with the least ama amount of mass possible? And, and so anyway, getting back to all that, it's in space manufacturing is key because if we can minimize our mass on orbit, um, we don't need a lot of mass. Uh, again, we just need to keep keep things uh, on orbit. Uh, so so the 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 only stress event that the space station ever sees is when it turns on its thrusters. And of course, you know this is another tiny rabbit hole, but like 
you know, the Russia has been providing station keeping for ISS. And this is a big contentious issue right now because, because of things going on. Um, and of course, also because they haven't been that great in the last two times at controlling the thrust. And so they actually bent parts of the space station, I believe, or it caused some structural damage uh, the last time they, they tried to keep, you know, give it that push to keep it back in orbit. Uh, but anyway, big long story short, uh, propulsion events really are minimal. Like when you compare, you know, the space station was built and in, in, in many, many, many cargo trips, many, many launches, and it was all put together. Um, so now we have this huge structure that's the size of many football fields. And, uh, you know, and, and it doesn't need to, you would never be able to launch that from the ground. It would completely just get destroyed with, with uh, launch, um, with, the, with the thrust and everything from, from forces from launch. Uh, so, yeah, if you were to build that in space and, and only launch, let's say, like raw ingots, um, number one, you could produce very thin bars or sheets or whatever that you may not even be able to produce on Earth. Uh, you know, you can think about making foils that are maybe a few atoms thick. Um, so you couldn't produce that on Earth. You know, you, th these are things you couldn't produce with gravity, period. Uh, you, you know, you might not be able to get like just those, just 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 to be able to make something that thin on Earth uh, it would be limited. And then to try to actually use it, uh, if you made a material that thin, if you had to like fold it up and launch it in a rocket and stuff like that, there's just no way. Uh, you couldn't be able to do it. What, Solar sails uh, are something that's similar that uh, thin foil films are used for. Uh, and one of the, probably the biggest hurdles for a solar sail is that it has to be folded so it can be launched and then has to be unfolded. So a significant amount of mass goes into making that, that foil so it doesn't just disintegrate when you try to fold it and unfold it. Anyway, you could make, you could make, you could just start printing sheets out that were many, many kilometers or unlimited size. If you were making those in orbit, you'd never have to pack them. They're, they're just floating in space. Um, again, beams, sheet metal, you, know, you, you can let your imagination go wild, but uh, anything you might see in Star Wars or Star Trek, you know, if you really wanted to make that happen, um, uh, Tycho Station, this is uh, the office that we share uh, over at Orbit Fab, it's called Tycho Station, but we, we talked about that a lot, like, you know, if you see if the intro uh, to that show, you can you can think of man, the like there's the expanse exactly. You know, yeah. you, you would you would uh, you wouldn't be able to launch all that mass from Earth and and build that. We really need to be able to derive those materials on orbit um, and then build in space so we can build things with less mass and and build bigger. Um, and then this is all again. It, it solves that. Com it, it goes a long way to helping with that problem of mass. So if we can build things in space. We can build them lighter, which means we don't need as much propellant. We can carry less propellant. It, uh, it basically just means that that we can do a lot more with less. And at the end of the day, uh, the lighter your spacecraft can be, it's it's all delta V is your limitation. So, you know, the reason we can't go to stars and things like that right now is because uh, we're limited. Uh, you know, we, we can't refuel ourselves, number one. Uh, so we're limited by our range of basically, you know, what's the most efficient rocket we can find and what's the furthest that can get us. And, and right now, you know, that's with like, with electric propulsion, uh, maybe that's 10 kilometers per second or something Delta V. Um, if we want to go further than that, we have to refuel ourselves. Uh, we have to have multiple stages and we have to reduce our mass significantly. Um, makes sense. The, um, so it's kind of like you can build the skeleton in space and it can be more scalable, like it can be bigger and it's more cost exactly. effective. And then people can ship up. Uh, I, you know, I'm kind of picturing like the Star Trek thing where you have like the skeleton of the Enterprise and people could like send up like the chips and stuff and wire it all together and then move to wherever you want to be. And that hardest part of getting everything up there is already done. Like as we were saying earlier, the hardest part is just getting things out of the gravity well and then you can have the whole solar system open up for you. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, so we look at the moon as a, as a stepping stone and we, but we also look at all these, you know, space station. Uh, we wrote a paper called recycle the ISS. Um, and, and this is, you know, we're not going to recycle all of the ISS. There's, there's, there's parts of it that make sense to the orbit um, and, and, you know, for various reasons, but there's other parts of the ISS, like there's beams and solar panels and <laughs> things like this, that they're already up there. And, you know, we can, we can reuse some of those beams as is, uh, we can we can break down some of them uh, and and use them as feedstock that we could print into wire or some kind of a sheet that we could use as a 
as a sail or as a, a, a sunshade. Um, you know, th there's a lot that we could do with that structure. Uh, and then we can, you know, I've heard anywhere, NASA did a study on it, but it's something like uh, between like two to 10 times more stuff that you can build on orbit from that, you know, so, so for one example, if you launch one kilogram, if, if you had something that weighed one kilogram and you had to launch it from, from the earth, you could turn that one kilogram into 10, you know, the same thing that it launches 10, 10 kilograms uh, from, you know, if you were to build it on space, you, you, or you could expand it 10 X. Um, so, you know, that's a, that's a pretty big advantage. So you could build a space station that was 10 times larger, for example. Uh, yeah. five, you know, let's say five to 10 times larger, obviously some things don't scale that way, but, um, you know, for a structural element, you think of a, a beam, if you can make those beams out of tubes that are, you know, a few thousandths of an inch thick versus a 16th of an inch thick, um, yeah, that beam's going to still have very good strength. Uh, it's going to be way less mass, uh, and you could make it way bigger. So. Is there, is there like partnerships and plans in place? Cause there's a lot of, uh, satellite and stuff up there right now when they look at a little uh picture of the earth with all the like the satellites going around there's lots of stuff there um it looks like it's quite polluted but i'm sure there's like tons of space in between it just looks that way because they have the scales and uh the the, the tags but right <laughs> are there plans to have like people go out there and like grab the things and, like bring it back to yours your type of floating platforms and like break it down and then output and start building things yeah like, so that's one of the coolest things here so so again, putting all this all together is if you build in space, you can leverage the materials and you can do a lot more with the mass, mm -hmm. which means you don't need as much propellant to keep that mass in orbit. There's just all kinds of benefits to that. Um, the other side of this is there's already a lot of mass up there that's just derelict, uh, you know, upper stages. They're just floating there. Um, some of this is in smaller pieces and, and, and getting smaller pieces is, is actually quite a challenge. But uh, our goal is to go after large you know, upper stages before they get smashed by another upper stage and turn into a million pieces. So if we can capture an upper stage, uh, the ones that we're looking at are, are like the size of a school bus. And there's, there's lots of them up there. Uh, and they all tend to be in, you know, their space is really large. And like you said, with the debris chart, it looks like it's pretty cluttered, but you know, it, it, the reality is, it's like, I mean, things are hundreds and hundreds of miles apart. If not for, you know, it's, it's very, you can't, these things are very far, far, far apart, but they're moving really fast. Uh, so the more of this debris we can get out of orbit now uh, before it crashes into itself and causes more debris, um, we can we can really make exponential improvements in reducing future debris fields. And it's made of aluminum. Mo most of these upper stages are made of aluminum. They're in clusters, so they're close together. So we can capture those and we can recycle those and turn them into metal feedstock, uh, which we can use to make new stuff in space. Uh, or we can actually make metal propellant, which can be used to keep those stations on orbit. Um, so, so we can really close some really get, you know, we can, we can kill two birds with, you know, we can solve a problem, get rid of space debris, uh, keep our, our station on orbit with the fuel or, or really propellant derived from that, uh, and, and build new stations, uh, that are, you know, with 10 times larger because we can build them on space and, and, and we can go 10 times, you know, further with that material, same mass. So, so yeah, there's, there's some pretty cool advantages there. Um, now, logistically, again, you know, we, we make the recycling uh, in that metal processing equipment. And the, the SBIR that we first won was actually for recycling space debris. Uh, so this space debris problem is near and dear to me. Um, you know, and NASA, of course, was interested in dual use uh, solutions that would solve, uh, would, would provide equipment that would do in-space uh, manufacturing and also solve uh, the problem of what do you do with all the space debris? Um, so the other thing that's interesting about space debris is it's kind of, a it's, it's, uh, it, 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 it impacts all of us. I mean, uh, you know, our, our cell phones, uh, rely on ground towers for the next couple of years. Uh, but a lot of our, even a lot of our cell phone, a lot of our structure is relying on, on satellites and things like this. Um, I'm, I'm sure by the end of this decade, um, this many constellations and all, all these constellations that are going to be built. Our, cell, our data is all going to come from satellites. So, uh, you know, being able to have that, those satellites operational and, and not being wiped out by space debris, you know, that's going to impact our daily lives. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of like uh, if you have a harbor and, you know, you're doing, you're shipping containers in and out of there and someone's, you know, you, you won't ever want to have a, a boat that's maintained because if their ship wrecks and sinks in the harbor, then nobody can use the harbor. 
And, uh, and that's, that's how we think about these orbits is, is they're kind of, uh, they're very similar. You know, if, if uh, one satellite gets, gets messed up and another one hits it, now you create this debris field, uh, you have a scenario where you might not be able to use one of these orbits. And, you know, it's, that's kind of the scenario of like not being able to use Long Beach uh, Harbor or something like that. That's, that would have devastating impacts to, to everybody. And uh, so, so yeah, um, it was not, so we're not even, we're not thinking about just how do we solve debris that's up there now? It's how do we uh, take care of debris that will be produced in the future? Um, now the FCC uh, or yeah, one of the, one of these groups, I think FCC has said that you have to deorbit, uh, you have to have a plan to deorbit any satellite within five years. Um, now that's pretty interesting because until now, most satellites were designed to be on orbit for like forever. They weren't, they were designed to just last forever to keep going, you know, but at least 20 years on orbit. And if you think about it, like, I mean, cars nowadays last about, you know, cars last 20 years now on average, but uh, in the seventies and eighties, when they were flying those launching these satellites, like nothing less, <laughs> it was kind of crazy to think about like building for that kind of reliability. Um, but but here's the problem is like back then they realized that, hey, either either we figure out a way to keep this thing going forever or it's it's just going to run out of it's just going to run out of gas and it's going to be sitting there derelict. It's going to run into other stuff. And, you know, at the time we weren't launching as many satellites and stuff. So, you know, that was OK, cool. We're going to keep keep this satellite out here in this spot and it's always going to be out in the desert and, and you don't have to worry about it. Um, of course, now we're trying to fly multi thousand satellite constellations. So you either have to guarantee that those are going to stay guided and be able to propel them, you know, and, and avoid hitting other things, or you have to guarantee that it's going to deorbit and not be in, in the domain where it could hit something. Um, so of course now you have the problem of, well, great, we'll deorbit it. So now, now all these satellites that used to be designed as like, you know, uh, long-term goods that would last forever, now they're all like throwaway things. And, and so now you have a proliferation of launch and uh, proliferation of, you know, we've seen some satellites, uh, some of the star, some of the gen one Starlinks have deorbited and people called 911 because it looked like, you know, we were getting hit by meteorites. And so, you know, I don't think that people are quite prepared for what, what, the world looks like uh, when you have thousands of satellites and constellations and you have multiple satellites. I mean, you're going to have satellites deorbiting every day uh, with constellations of those size. And it's going to be a, a major event. And, you know, at first it's going to be like, oh, wow, that's startling, you know, kind of world, the world, world's kind of like people will be, you know, public may not have any impact, but it's going to startle people. Um, Long-term though, uh, there's going to be an impact from, the number of rocket launches that it takes to sustain that. Um, and then also we don't know what that amount of deorbiting uh, into the atmosphere does because we've never come anywhere close to that. Uh, but, you know, basically it's kind of like, Hey, let's, what if we set up a factory in Antarctica? You know, what happened? We don't know. <laughs> but it's, it's, it, there's, there's, there's reason to think that it might not be great. You know, there could be side effects. Um, you know, how many rockets do you, you know, we, we know that, for example, you know, whenever a, a rocket launches, there's, there is an isolated environment that occurs around the rocket plume. Um, you know, we don't launch enough rockets to really be able to study this well enough to know, but, but obviously anything within, you know, some, some volume of the air, cer certainly any, anything that's anywhere close to that rocket plume is being completely ionized and, and, you know, there's, there's something, there's something going on. So um, what happens when we have launches like that, you know, 10 launches like that a day? Uh, we don't know, but, uh, but that's why in-space manufacturing is something that, you know, NASA and everyone else, it, it, all the governments of the world are thinking about that. Like, you know, there's going to come a point where just like with cars, it's like, Hey man, we have, we got to not send as many of these, we figure out a better way to do this. Or like, Maybe we should grow our food more locally or produce things more local and, and not drive them across the country. Uh, but, you know, space is going to have to come that way. I think, um, you know, I like to think about all these constellations and, you know, right now our only way to service these is from, you know, launching a rocket up there. Um, but it's, it also takes time to get a rocket into, 
to, you know, think about if, if you, uh, you know, there, there's also uh, space stations for Hilton has a human, you know, they, they're going to do a hotel in space. Um, what, what happens if you're in that hotel and something happens and it's like, yeah, well, we'll fix it as soon as we get the rocket up there. Um, you, know, you might not have that much time to wait. So, so, you know, for a lot of reasons, it makes sense to have this infrastructure of supporting these constellations uh, on orbit uh, in the form of multiple space stations, salvage yards. Uh, we actually have a proposal right now for in-space salvage yards. Uh, so you have a second option. You don't have to deorbit in five years. You can sell your equipment to Cislunar and we'll take it and we'll salvage it and recycle what we can. Um, you know, we may, we may salvage it in the form of, you know, the, the space bus or like the, you know, the, the frame is probably fine. So we, we might just use that the way it is. Um, you know, a lot of times the reason why these satellites uh, have to be deorbited is because they run out of propellant, you know, they just need to be refueled. So, uh, you know, we work, uh, orbit fab is, is, uh, you know, we've worked with them as far as, uh, looking at how you would refuel these things. Uh, potentially using these salvage yards as a dual use. You know, this could be the refueling area. This could be your refurbishing, uh, you know, where you repair these things. Uh, it could just be a staging ground for uh, service vehicles, uh, autonomous uh, servicing vehicles that might, you know, go to the station as a mothership and then go back and, you know, replace a circuit board or swap a battery out or something like that on one of these satellites. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's just amazing to think that uh, there's so many of these satellites flying you know, even a, a, a geosynchronous satellite communication satellite from like the nineties um, I've, I've, I've uh, read that, you know, it could be anywhere, you know, it can be $150 million a year uh, revenue for an old, you know, 20 year old legacy satellite. And you know, the only thing you got to do to keep it going is, is maybe refuel it and swap a circuit board or, you know, give it a new battery or something. <laughs> so, um, so I think that there's going to be, you know, near term, we're going to have a lot of that happening uh, where we where instead of having to send rockets up for these individual service missions, um, we can have swarms of service vehicles that are always in space that are refueling themselves on derelict old, you know, things that have to be recycled um, and then and then using those resources to service the ones that are, you know, keep the other ones on orbit. Um, and then, you know, and shortly after that, uh, you know, we see we see a situation where we're actually building these things on orbit. Um, so, you know, it could be that it still makes sense to ferry. You know, you, you send a cargo ship up from Earth, uh, but then we use these uh, stations to, uh, you know, extend what we, you know, we can. Maybe we build build a lot of the structural components so that we don't have to launch them and we save on that mass. Um, but we still send up circuit boards and stuff like this because it's, you know, it's easier just to make those on, on the ground. Um, but, but there is a point in time where making everything uh, will eventually become uh, more economical to do in space because simply because we don't have to get out of the gravity well of the Earth. Um, the moon is made out of the same stuff as the Earth. Um, you know, at, at least the current theory is that it was part of the Earth until some cataclysmic, until they, you know, some, some event happened that separated the two. So um, the Earth is the same thing as the moon, uh, or the moon is the same thing as the Earth without biological activity. Uh, so all the minerals, all the silicon, all the all the all the minerals that we would need uh, to make to make all the stuff, all the circuit boards, they all they all exist there. Um, and beyond the and beyond the moon, they exist on on satellite on um, on, on asteroids and things like that. Uh, so, uh, but, but yeah, so I think that uh, what we're going to see is uh, supported manufacturing on, on these manufacturing platforms. And then pretty rapidly, we're going to see human presence on the moon, uh, which is going to encourage the type of uh, exploration and the type of uh, investment in infrastructure to get us to these economies of scale where it will be more economical to produce things on the moon which will be used as stepping stones to do asteroid manufacturing or mining and, and wherever else go to the, you know, Mars, Mars is carbon, which is really cool. So we can build polymers and stuff on Mars. Uh, but I don't think we're going to get to Mars uh, sustainably until we, we have a stepping stone on the moon uh, and have that ability to make things in space. So. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like <clears throat> what you're working on and what uh, a number of people are working on will kind of meet the FCC or, you know, there's so many agencies out there requirement of like have an end of life plan for it, which is great. Especially if, if everyone's like putting in an elephant graveyard or a junkyard, kind of just like 
you know, give them the last bit of uh, push to get it there. And at the same time, uh, it kind of sounds, uh, I think one of SpaceX is my, I use SpaceX a lot because I'm, I'm a fan, but SpaceX's model is basically like they're the inner, they're the, there's a railroad that connected the West Coast and the East Coast. The yeah. Intercontinental yeah. Railroad. Yeah. That, that's basically how they see themselves. This seems, your technology seems very similar to that, like a parallel to building out the infrastructure that connects everything together. Because if you're repurposing all the this uh, material up there, if there's mining going on on the moon or whatever's going on up there, this ability to repurpose it and, you know, uh, multiply it by five to ten and then have other people bring up, you know, select chips or whatever from like, you know, Thailand or wherever the heck you're getting chips nowadays. Um, that seems like a similar thing of building out the infrastructure that allows it to go as well. So it seems to me that, you know, as they're building out the, the moon base, you're just building out what you're doing also will be you know, building that connection tissue to allow even more stuff to be happening, which leads me to the question of um, when do you think like Tycho station beta or alpha or whatever, you know, your, your first initial um, everything coming together will be. I, uh, we, we're working on demonstrations that could occur before the end of the decade. Um, so before 2030, um, we're on track to do a demonstration on the international space station um, in 2024. Uh, and then from there, we have a rapid TRL uh, advancement plan to do a number of uh, orbital flights with free flyers that return Earth so we can get rapid rapid data collection. Um, and then this would culminate with a commercial space station demonstration uh, where we would we would have a, a company that does uh, uh, debris capture, capture debris, bring it to station. Uh, we would have our, our modular space foundry hosted on that station, and we would take debris, uh, convert that into propellant uh, and structural elements, and then we would uh, use that propellant to keep that station on orbit. Uh, and to also, we're, we're looking at to see if that propellant would be good enough for the uh, for the spacecraft that 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 tug, you know, the space tug that would bring the debris to us and serve as spacecraft. Um, so this is pretty pretty interesting uh, model because you have this scenario where you could be perpetually gathering propellant in the form of old you know, spacecraft that can't be used anymore, they're into life. So now instead of them floating around on their own and causing more space debris, they're all captured, you know, and they're 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 on this stage and they're they're being kept on orbit on the salvage yard. Um, so then and then also, you know, so you're you're taking some of those and you're turning those as propellant, which you can uh, keep on keep keep that salvage yard and manufacturing yard orbiting. Uh, and then you can also sell some of that propellant and have it distributed by these space tugs. Uh, so you're creating that whole that whole ecosystem, and now of course this is this is slow. So like what SpaceX is doing is really uh, driven towards human exploration, and and there's there's like two schools of thoughts here. There's there's like the real space geeks who are like, eh, why why would you complicate things by sending a person up there, um, you know? And then there's the other side of it. it's like, well, nobody's gonna care unless you send people up there, and I'm kind of in between, but I, I do realize that. Uh, you know, Apollo, all these things, like at a certain point uh, to reach those economies of scale, uh, you can only get so excited about a, a Mars rover or some kind of robot. Like the idea that there's someone up there and they might die if they don't have, you know, this structure and this this infrastructure, that's that's what's going to build the economy of scale that we need to really to make this happen. And also just the fact that, like, you know, there's there's a surprising number of people that are wealthy enough to pay for their own private space flights that are willing to do that. That are willing to pay to stay on, you know, the, the Hilton on the space station for a week for, you know, whatever would, you know, the, the economy of a small country, but that's, there's, there's people willing to do that. And there, and, and, and the amount of infrastructure we can build uh, to support that human presence, like, you know, we have to get over the threshold of, a few little prototypes, a few little scientific experiments aren't, aren't going to cut it. We need industrial infrastructure and we need to be able to mass produce things at a certain uh, economy of scale in order to make it worthwhile. And, and, and I'm, I'm saying this all to tee up to back to SpaceX where, um, you know, uh, using the propulsion technology that SpaceX is using in, in, in their Starship um, and Falcon, um, you know, th these have to be refueled. Um, this, this kind of propulsion technology is great because it's high thrust. Um, so for human transportation, you know, you can get to Mars in a few months or to the moon in, in you know, a few days, uh, that's what's required, uh, with the kind of propulsion that we can do with, uh, metal propulsion. It's, it's similar to Krypton and other e-propulsion, 
you know, it's going to take a long time to get anywhere. So that this kind of propulsion technology is good for servicing, uh, for resub, you know, for, for, for cyclers that are slowly resupplying uh, or keep, you know, station, you know, keeping a platform on orbit over a long period of time. Uh, they're not going to be great for human transportation. So, so what's going to happen is the cost of making all, you know, the cost of a kilogram in space, the kilogram to the moon or whatever destination is going to fall precipitously as SpaceX and Rocket Lab and all these other companies, Blue Origin, get their rockets on order. And, and the more flights they have, the, you know, the price is going to go down to a certain point. Um, but what our economic studies have shown is that, you know, once you hit that certain threshold in the economy of scale, like all other things, um, terrestrially, uh, the, the cost production, our cost production is also going to fall because our cost production is linked to the cost of a kilogram on orbit. Um, so eventually what's going to happen is, you know, as launch costs, you know, they're not going to ever approach zero. Um, it always costs more to get something into space than it does to get something, to ship something terrestrially. Um, but obviously foundries and metal production are very viable terrestrially, even with shipping costs being what they are. So, uh, you know, based on a similar model, there are always going to be a need to build things in space. And you know, the the drop in price and, and, and logistics and, and getting things here and there is is only going to uh, facilitate and enable uh, our abilities to drop our production prices faster. Um, so, but they will always track. You know, uh, there, there's a couple papers uh, about this that that show that cost of production is going to track uh, cost of logistics uh, pretty closely, um, and, and that you know that there will always be some kind of advantage to being able to produce where you need the materials or as close as you can. That makes sense. Um... I don't remember where I'm picturing this from. It might have been from uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, but it's this ability to have, like, there's, like, a central device, and there's, like, a long piece of rope, and then, like, a, an anchor on the other side, and you, like, grab something on one end, and he kind of, like, spins around, and you could, like, I think I was reading in the context of, like, putting things on the moon and taking it off for manufacturing. It was, like, spinning yeah. thing. Yeah, so Could you do that the same thing for... Okay, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, so that's called a skyhook, I think, is what you're talking about. Um, yeah, and it so, was just like, uh, you had like a counterweight, and I had like a little thing to grab it, and just move it around. So I was just wondering if you could use that in yeah, yeah, orbit, or is there like too much you, stuff going there, on? There's some good YouTube videos uh, about how skyhooks work to really, uh, if you see an animation of how a skyhook works, it makes a lot more sense. But but mm -hmm. essentially, um, you know, you have a hook that's, you know, you have an imaginary, you have a, 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 you know, say this is like the moon floating, and you have a, a imaginary point and you have a, a line rotating around this. And so, and this is orbiting. And so that hook drops down really close and then, uh, and you have a counterweight. And as long as the physics work out, that's a really good way to, to, to get things into space with, with uh, minimal, you know, there's always trade-offs though. So like, you know, there's, you have to keep that sky hook on orbit. And you have yeah. to keep, you know, whenever you pick up something, you have to, um, you know, equal and opposite force. So, so typically that means that there's, you know, so, so the advantage to like a skyhook for uh, something with an atmosphere is perhaps better than, uh, you know, like the moon where there is no atmosphere. Um, I think, I think for the moon or Mars, for example, a skyhook would probably work pretty well in Mars because you, you know, you want to try to sweep down into the atmosphere um, and, and have the advantage of this, you know, no atmosphere orbiting body in space to sweep it out of there. Um, I think that's kind of what, what the thought is there, but, but, you know, you still have, you still have to, there's still propellant used to keep that um, sky hook going. And, mm. and, you know, th so I think it's not a can, good replacement for the tugs. Can, so, well, so one of the other, so, so, and a, a rabbit hole, we're going to get into <laughs> astrophysics here, but it's like, uh, okay. You know, the higher your elevation, your orbit is, um, the the less drag there is, and the less station keeping maintenance is required. So there's so if you had a really massive station, which would have to be really massive to have this sky hook, because if if it weren't, then like you know grabbing the spaceship would it'd pull it down. You know, you imagine like if you tried to lasso another person the same size as you, <laughs> you'd pull yourself just as much as you'd pull them. Um, yeah. You know, so so I think that there may be advantages when you have certain, you know, really high altitudes. But, but anyway, I don't know a whole lot about skyhooks. Uh, they're fascinating. <laughs> right now, we don't have the materials really to make them work uh, in either 
you know, for the moon or for Earth or really any application yet. I think uh, for, for lunar applications, um, things like that are attractive. Uh, space elevators potentially would work. Um, I mean, like, I understand that we have the materials now uh, to do a space elevator on the moon uh, because it has uh, significantly less gravity than, than the Earth. Um, but whether or not that elevator would be useful is another question because, you know, um, for, for uh, an elevator to work, a lot of times what you would do is you'd use like the, the rotational force of the spinning to, to hold itself out and to keep the, the elevator line taut or whatever. Um, uh, and then, you know, depending on, on, on where you're at, so maybe you have it like tied around the equator, but that doesn't necessarily put you at a trajectory that you'd want to be at. So there's, there's uh, again, this isn't my field, especially either, but there's, there's pros and cons to all these technologies. It's like, you know, with the space elevators, like, cool. Okay. Well now we have our thing up here, but now what do we do? You know, what do we, do we have enough, um, velocity now to, to keep in orbit? Um, or to, you know, to start our trajectory to go to the next thing. Um, but uh, it is really interesting to think about how these things might enable in-space manufacturing, because, of course, if you could get out of the gravity well of the moon for free, um, you know, I've, I've had these wild ideas of like, oh, well, you know, we have a, a foundry, you know, some kind of a, a refinery down, down, you know, just taking ore and turning it into aluminum, and then, and then maybe it could, like, send a wire up up the space elevator and uh, then we could just start printing things of unlimited size uh, on orbit, uh, but without having to actually ever launch anything where you just continuously be sending materials up to orbit through the elevator. Um, so, you know, you can let your mind go wild with that stuff. It's definitely, definitely us space people let, let our minds wander probably more than we should on some of that stuff, but it's, uh, you know, they're all stepping stones. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, you have to, it's like, well, the, the technology to do uh, A, B, C, D, and E exists, and like, you know, we know that Q Q is off a little further out, and we have to figure out a few more elements of the alphabet before we can get there. But it's definitely, you know, um, if you can't imagine it, you're never gonna think of doing it. So, you know, having that thought in our heads that hey, we need to be able to make a space, or this this is a way we could do it, definitely uh, causes I think a lot of us to think about how to make materials that would be useful for a space elevator or a tether. Makes sense. And I think uh, this is a, a good transition to read a quote that I looked up because I know we wanted to talk about STEM and related yeah, uh, activities. And since you like Tesla coils, I thought I'd find you a, a quote from tech, uh, Nikola Tesla. And uh, uh, basically, I just want to hear your thoughts on it. And I, th I think we're going to talk about uh, some ideas on how to get more, uh, more people into STEM. But uh, the, 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 the quote goes uh, from Nikola Tesla which was uh, like a perpetually bachelor man. So I think maybe he was biased here, but he said, uh, I don't think you can name many inventions created by married men. Uh, <laughs> the thoughts of, as a guy with, who's married, has kids and invents stuff all the time. I think it's a good quote. I, you know, Tesla, <laughs> my, uh, one of my daughters is Nicola after he's, she's mm -hmm. named after Tesla. Um, so, uh, I have a real fond spot for Tesla. Um, and I do think that that is, you know, that is a struggle for sure. Uh, the balance between family life and raising, you know, raising a family and, and providing them the kind of uh, attention that is needed uh, while doing something uh, like this in a STEM field. It definitely takes work. It takes, takes, <laughs> it, it takes a concerted effort to do these things. Um, I think that, you know, I, I, part of this, I think, is modern technology helps uh, bridge that gap. I was able to transition from uh, my 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 job in high speed manufacturing into this field, uh, thanks in part to COVID and and being able to work remotely. Um, you know, uh, to 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 build the network of people and to meet. You know, most I was able to do a pretty parallel transition uh, where you know initially I had built my network of people by flying all over the country. You know, I used to travel every other week. And, uh, you know, do multiple sales calls a day or multiple just meetings with people, um, going to conferences all the time. And I think nowadays it's a lot easier to get on a Zoom call. And, uh, you know, like all of the NASA folks that we keep in touch with, um, most of the time we just via Zoom. I've actually, I've only been to the NASA facilities a handful of times. So, um, you know, if I had started this endeavor before COVID, 
before uh, remote stuff was really, you know, ferreted out like this, it, it, it would have been more of a challenge. Um, so, you know, I think that's, that's part of the secret sauce as far as like, you know, starting a business, co-founding a company like this uh, takes a lot of, takes a lot of work and there aren't, you know, as much as you try to set, um, you know, guidelines for, I'm going to work at this time, you know, these are my work hours. These are the times uh, I do that kind of stuff. But any entrepreneur will tell you when you're the entrepreneur, when you're the CEO, when you're the CTO, you know, there are times when you can't, you know, you, you have to, you have to take that call uh, in the middle of the night or whatever. Uh, you can't, you can't always. Uh, so, uh, but, but yeah, I think it's uh, using technology and setting expectations. It, it is important um, to set, you know, I have, I have a, I share my calendar uh, with everybody that I work with. Uh, you know, most of us, half of us are co-founders now and, and half of us now are employees, uh, but it's, it's transparent. We try to set that culture for everybody so that, um, that, you know, everyone knows that they're not expected to, you know, work 80 hours every week and, and not see their family. You know, it's, it's definitely, we try to set that corporate culture that, you know, th this, this, this may be your dream to go to space. This may be your dream job. Um, but, you know, there's more to life than just, than just doing this space stuff. You know, there's, you, you know, you, you want to have, want to make sure that people have a, you know, good family life balance and can have kids if they want to. And, and that, you know, what motivates me too is like, I, I don't think I can get enough done. Like I know that, you know, I'm, I'm going to be 40 here soon. And I feel like, uh, like, wow, I can already see, you know, my dad's going to be 80 and he's, he's like, he seems to be at the peak of his life right now, but I can tell like he's, he's, there's, there's a million things that he wants to do. And, um, you know, I'm going to keep it. That's, that's what I see. I, I want to make sure that I, uh, that, that, that my kids and, and other people can have kids and that they can, uh, continue to pursue these things because there's just too much, you know, and, and to pursue other things that they want to pursue in STEM or, you know, whatever it is that not, not my endeavor, but just, I think where society needs to go, we need people to be inquisitive and to, to be thinking about this stuff. And we need people specifically like me and in STEM to have kids. If people like it's too bad Tesla didn't have kids really at the end of the day, I think yeah. uh, he could have been a lot, we could have learned a lot. We could have gotten a lot out of him in his, in his later years. I think that's, that's what I think about all the time with, about half my friends don't have children and about half of them do. Um, well, Elon's making up for that. So. Yeah. Well, but then, you know, but let's face it. I don't think Elon's a real model father. I don't aspire to be, to be <laughs> yeah, no, it's just as a joke. far as the parent goes in any, any way. Um, so, and I do, I, I, I take uh, at four o'clock, I'll be taking my kids to nutcracker practice. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, my, my daughter just came in here to see what I was doing. My, my youngest daughter wants to be an astronaut and uh, my, my, my older two, um, I don't know if they want to be astronauts, but um, they're, they're all interested in STEM fields. Um, yeah. my, my oldest two daughters are very uh, medically, you know, they're, they're really into, uh, you know, uh, uh, prosthetics and uh, yeah. saving people and that kind of stuff. And my youngest is very into engineering and solving problems and that kind of stuff. But it's, it's interesting to see how this uh, presents itself, especially, um, you know, especially when, and, and a house like ours where you can't avoid it, you know, you're, it's, you know, for at two years old, they were driving go-karts that I made them and stuff like this. And, you know, it's just, they're inundated with it. Whereas, um, you know, it's interesting to me to see, um, I, I volunteer at the elementary school that they go to and to see like to kids from all kinds of different households that, you know, have this spark of interest in STEM stuff. And, and like, you know, how do you, how do you encourage those kids to get into it? Um, you know, especially if they don't have that kind of encouragement, like how do you, how do you get teachers that'll be like, Hey, you know, this is cool. Like pursue this, you know, ask questions, figure out how this works. Um, but you know, getting back to the first question is like, and then how do you pursue it without ignoring everyone? Cause that, that tends STEM people, uh, tend to, uh, get very focused and be kind of like uh, single tracks at mm -hmm. the uh, fault of everybody else's. So it's, uh, uh, maybe we should have a class for this, like how to have a good work family balance when you're a, when you're a STEM person or something. <laughs> yeah. Like, it sounds like it's a lot. Yeah. Uh, how, how do you encourage your kids other than just being yourself to get into uh, STEM? I mean, uh, I, it's funny. I, I try not to give them, I try not to force them into things. Cause like, I know as a kid, I wanted to rebel against stuff that, you know, my dad did. Um, 
you know, so, so I think it's more is it's, it's trying to create networks among peers uh, and, and so that they identify around STEM type things. Um, I try to point out like when STEM stuff is being used, uh, you know, in daily lives, like, Hey, isn't that cool? Like, do you want to know how that works? Or like, um, I know, I think that, uh, you know, my, my youngest daughter, uh, she told me, she's like, man, I really, I'm really into baking. And so, you know, I really was like, cool, let's make something. And, and, and by asking those questions, I found out that she, she doesn't really want to make a cake. She, she wants to build a factory that can make a bunch of stuff. And then she wants to put that on the moon or something. So like, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I think that it's, you know, communicating with kids and asking them like, you know, well, what do you mean by that? Like, well, how would you do that? Or like, what do you think that might look like? And, you know, and seeing where that takes you, because just, um, I heard some, I heard some really interesting story by some psychologist who is like, you know, uh, humans have this tendency to think they're really good at perceiving what other people think. And we're really awful at perceiving what other, like we're really, we're actually awful at it. Like nine times out of 10, we have no idea what the other person's thinking, but we think they do. And so we have this false reinforcement that we, we understand those things. So, so anyway, I think that comes back to like, you know, we have this great ability to talk and to ask questions. And so um, I think that, yeah, the, the key to all things, and, and really the key to STEM as an engineer, I always tell people like, don't ever, the, the, the worst fault you can have is thinking, you know, the answer when you don't. And, you know, and it's like, oh yeah, I looked at all the evidence. I did my own research and it's like, okay, so how much evidence did you get? It's like, oh, I found three different things that, that support what I believe is true. It's like, well, guess what? There's, there's 60 more things that you haven't found yet. And you sure you want to make that decision based on three out of 60, you know, there, you know, that really, so, so again, like I tend to think of it, you know, as even, even in a field where I can make something and I can measure it and I can, I can do it three times and I can find a trend and say, Hey, you know, strength material is probably going to break here. I'm very careful about saying like, this is such and such, or this is, you know, something black and white. It's like, well, based on what we know, you know, that's the thing, but like, I don't know. Let's keep asking questions. Like why, why, why do you think, do you think it'll work in this thing? Well, what if we stick it over there? Will it still do the same thing? So, so anyway, it, it's same thing that we do for science and engineering is, is I think uh, with, with kids and STEM and, you know, is, is to ask those questions. And, uh, and so I also ask a lot of other, my peers that are engineers that have kids like, well, how do you do it? Like, how do you balance this? Like, what is, what is the secret to all that? And so, um, you know, um, I try to work from home whenever I can. Um, so, you know, I work a lot, but uh, I have time in between like to, I, I try to walk my kids to school every day, for example. I've heard, I've heard that from other entrepreneurs, like, you know, to make sure you take your kids to school once every day. And, and it's important because not only do you get that time, like it's dedicated time that you can look forward to and, and rely on a lot. A lot of life is like looking forward to stuff, which is weird. You know, it's just that expectation. Um, but you also get a chance to like meet the neighbors and to see who your kids' friends are and see what's going on in the community and like, you know, and, and make yourself be present. I think that's, you know, I see that with a lot of, yeah, you know, growing up, I remember I, I, I knew a lot of, I was lucky enough to know a lot of science, you know, some people because they were retired, but the neighborhood my parents moved into was like mostly retired people. So, you know, but like, if I had known them 10 years prior, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have known them. They would have been doing their job. <laughs> it would have been at the university or doing whatever. So, you know, it's kind of interesting to, you know, I got to access these people because they were retired, but uh, a lot of my mentors had, you know, had kids, but they didn't, you know, they were like Elon Musk. They didn't, have relationships with these kids. Uh, so, yeah. so I think that's part of it too, is that from an early age, I realized that I, you know, I, I don't know if I said, I wasn't like, you know, my daughters will be like, I want to have two and a half kids and I want, you know, whatever. They <laughs> have these funny things. Um, but I definitely was like, I, I think I want to be a dad and have, have a family. And like, I know that this is going to be a challenge. Uh, you know, I don't want to be like, you know, I want to be, I want to be present with the kids. I want to be, you know, so I, I think from an early age, I thought about these things and, and maybe that helps. So yeah. I've talked to a number of entrepreneurs and sometimes we talk about this subject on the camera versus off. 
And it, it seems like a couple of variables that are really important are like the kids tend to naturally want to play where you dream, you know, where your yep. mind is at. So like this idea is like, I want to build something on the moon. It's like, I, I want to, I basically want to be where you are, like where you're spending your mental time. And the other thing is like, do you make time for them to talk to you about it? I think that sometimes, especially in STEM, I think sometimes in STEM, people aren't really encouraged to have the best social skills. Yeah. Or in like other industries, you're expected to be a little bit more uh, better at like how you interact with other people. I like STEM for whatever reason, people are just a little bit more understanding if you're not so good. So then you're not encouraged to do better. So I think yeah. like creating that space where you can just be quiet and like walk with them on, on, on uh, uh, going to school. I think that's huge. I imagine um, just in terms of like encouraging them to like, cause if you, if you didn't have that space, they would see, they, they wouldn't probably connect with it in the same way. They'd be, they'd probably be discouraged where you're like, Oh dad, how do you do this? And you're like, Oh, I'm too busy. I, I got to go build a flux capacitor to yeah. save Marty for the future or something. It's like, Oh, that's neat. I'm going to go, I guess go do something else. It's sad. So, so I act, I really try um, like my daughter just came in here a minute ago to see what I was doing, but I, you know, I encourage them to, to come and, you know, when you come home from school, come see what I'm doing, <laughs> you know? And um, so I think that's important and, and being able to work from home most of the time. So, you know, so they can see what's going on. I think it's cool. I, I really like, I don't know why we had these office parks and stuff, but I like, I talk a lot about like, you know, labor and, and working and how, you know, our, our, what, what people think is like what works. It's like, it's only been like that for 50 years or so. I mean, like it's, it's what our factors. parents did, but it's just, that's just what your perception is based on very limited knowledge. Um, so, yeah. you know, this idea of this office park that we, that our parents used to all go to and work at, you know, it's like, well, I don't know. Like, I think we need to change that up. Like having, uh, my neighbor talks about how he grew up around an airport all the time. And, uh, you know, his, his parents were first generation, uh, you know, United States folks. And like, he, he became a consultant for HP, did really well for himself. Um, and we asked, we talked about that a lot. It's like, well, what was different for you? It's like, well, I don't know. I was by the airport. I could go talk to these pilots. And I just like, for my time, I was early age. I was like, I'm going to be a pilot. I want to be an engineer. And like, you know, and when, when dad was off drinking or whatever, I was hanging out with the old guys at the airport, like learning how to fly, you know, so so I think that like, uh, well, it, it Colorado is, I live in Colorado and it's uh, same thing with like housing and stuff. Like it, they're, they're required to have all kinds of different housing communities all intermixed. And so you end up without, like, we don't have bad areas really, at least, you know, in the parts of the Northern Colorado where I live, there's just pretty, you know, it's, it, it works out pretty well. So I think that that's, you know, how do you, how do you encourage people to see this and, and to be motivated in the first place? Cause like, you know, how do you even know to be interested in something if you've never witnessed it? If you've never seen yeah. an airplane fly, like, you know, like, yeah, you know, that's even something you might want to do. Um, I know that, uh, so uh, Steve, he's our, our, one of our electrical engineers, uh, grew up uh, in Chicago. And uh, at least uh, early on, like in middle school, he was in a, a pretty bad neighborhood and like, you know, all the, all the stuff you hear about. And he was telling me how, like, it was really interesting because like stereotypically, like the kind of stuff he was, he was building Tesla coils. You know, he invented a lot of these really crazy Tesla coils that you hear about. Um, and, and like stereotypically, like these were not the school he went, nobody did that stuff. Like people usually didn't graduate and whatever, but he had this following and like people were really into it because he was doing it. And they, they were like, we never knew this stuff existed. Like, this is so cool. Like how, you know, so it's just, it's just interesting how, um, you know, being able to, to see that, um, so, so it comes back to like changing the way we think about working where it's like, you know, we, we have a real hybrid model at Cislunar where uh, we have an office, um, you can go in there and work with everybody and we can have meetings at the board table and all that stuff. You can sit in a cubicle if you want to. Um, but most of our engineers have their own, uh, their own shops. Uh, they can build, practically build space rated hardware in their own, their own personal shops. And so it's like, well, you know, do do whatever works best you know if you, if you spend i i typically encourage them to spend like three days uh doing like deep work where they're focusing on stuff and and you know if that's at their house or in their 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 shop attached to their house like great that works great uh and then maybe two days like in the lab where we're together trying to learn stuff you know you know and, and working together side by side uh but you know that kind of hybrid model is really interesting because you don't necessarily, you know, some utopian thing where you could have like 
elementary school is in the factory where you do all the stuff and like you know I, I don't know when we're gonna get to that point but like in the intermediate it's like hey look you know like hey uh three days out of the week i'm i'm here my kids can can sit here and do homework next to me and see what i'm doing and vice versa and they're encouraged to ask questions like you know and then the other parts i'm i'm there in the office dressing up in a suit doing the things you're you know meet, doing all this stuff like um you know, but, but I think, uh, yeah, for STEM, it's important, like kids should see how we work and, and, and also see kind of have an idea of what, what work is good work and what work maybe, uh, you know, coming back to Tesla, I like, I like to talk about it like this a lot too, is like, what is work? Like, what is your dream job? And I have people, I love the response. Well, what's your dream job? Well, my, my dream, my dream is not to have to work. Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't dream of work, I guess. Like I, I dream of like being fulfilled or, you know, whatever. But I think that, um, you know, in STEM and a lot of these areas, I see that a lot where it is encompassing. And that's why it is, it's hard, sometimes hard to have a relationship because it can be such a deep encompassing thing. Um, so, you know, um, you have to make your family and your friends be kind of like in on it. <laughs> you know, it's, you, you, if STEM is your life, then, you make your family part of that life and, and it's all kind of, you know, uh, interchangeable. Uh, Makes but, sense. Yeah. I know we, have, I think we have time for like a really quick question, which sure. is, uh, yeah. uh, what books do you recommend sci-fi fantasy? And then I, I know you gotta go, gotta go to the nutcracker. Oh, man. I'm reading, uh, the wiki, um, the wiki is, uh, one of the physicists, um, that, you know, he, he was, he was a contemporary of like, Stephen Hawking's. The wiki, yeah, Z W I C K. Okay, I thought you were just saying like, wiki, the wiki, yeah, like you're reading Z like Wikipedia. Z wiki. So, okay. I think, I think I'm spelling it correctly. Z W I C K E Y Y, I believe. But um, because of uh, recent stuff with the uh, with the James Webb Telescope, uh, there's a lot of things that Zwicky and like Einstein and you know a lot of these other physicists um, thought was you know they hypothesized, uh, and but now we're actually starting to see it. So like. Hawking radiation, things like this. Like uh, there was a a really bright light discharge from uh, from one of these black holes recently, and you know until I think it was until James Webb went online, there was it was only hypothetical that like a black hole could ever get rid of mass. Like there was the thought that a black hole only could absorb things, and so you know now with James Webb we're able to see these things occurring. Uh, so anyway, I think. Uh, uh, I, I really like to read stuff by physicists like that. Zwicky is really great. Um, uh, there's this, gosh, I'm, I'm awful at, at trying to remember people's names. Uh, Richard Feynman has an he's autobiography awesome. um, that he wrote. That's phenomenal. Um, he's a little, uh, he's a little weird in that biography, but I think he's a very kind of an eccentric yeah. guy. So it makes sense. Yeah. I, I like, I, I mean, I think that, uh, well, Einstein, I guess, and then, <laughs> and then uh, Feynman kind of took, or no, it was, it was uh, Tesla said that like, basically all you need to know about is vibration and, you know, atoms and essentially uh, Feynman took that and refined it a little bit in one of his famous lectures. But, you know, he's like, if you, if you could only learn one thing about science, you should know that everything is based on atoms and, yeah. you know, basically how fast they're moving. And that's, you know, you can derive all of physics from that understanding. So, um, that, so I really that's actually like that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's actually how I figured out why. Well, I was thinking about like, why is there no ceiling on how hot something can get? Why is there a floor on how cold something get can get? It's all based on the items. At a certain point, like the items can't really move. So yeah, that was neat. Yeah, exactly. So so anyway, I, I found that the Feynman Richard Feynman's he read. I thought that was. Uh, I think about. I think about that a lot. Um, and then other really influential books were uh, Skunk Works by uh, about uh, Lindsey Johnson just as far as, you know, CTO type aerospace books, that's, that's a must read. Um, right. I think the way Lindsey Johnson set up things is really important. And also uh, HP, we, we derive a lot of, uh, of, of influence from the early years of HP. Uh, I like the fact that, you know, HP was founded with uh, an idea and they didn't really know what their product was. <laughs> they were like, well, you know, we're really good at making stuff. So we'll, and we're really smart. So we'll figure it out. And so um, I like to think about that as like, uh, you know, a, a business, like a, a business that can last a long time and actually be beneficial is a business that, that has a way of thinking and that can breed 
future, you know, can continue to crank out generations of engineers and thinkers that, that can execute and, and solve problems and, and build upon that. So thank you for joining us today with the learn with Lowell show. Check us out at learnwithlowell.com. Anywhere podcasts can be found, subscribe, tell me what you thought of this episode. Check us out on YouTube in particular. It's a new thing I'm doing. Uh, Timestamps and links are in the show notes. Thank you for coming. And I hope everyone, every one of you found something today that you're curious about to learn more about. And you'll go out and be curious and learn something new. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.